These are just some folks that are hung up on predestined, preordained, and foreordained, and words like decrees, and even if they can't put scripture with it, uh, they're just hung up with it. And, uh, and this kind of a doctrine can lead to, uh, will kill your witnessing, it'll kill your spirit uh, in the Lord, eventually you'll seem like you're a robot, it sort of takes away your free will to do anything. And what it does is it seems like whatever you do is ordained from God. And we know that uh, people that are even unsaved have a will. Uh, they exercise it. You get saved. You still got the same will. You exercise the will. You do it every day of your life. Um, for you to say that uh, God predestined, preordained for you to sin. Uh, last, last week, I believe it was, we covered some verses on that where God can't even think that kind of thought. A holy God, if you could just think about a holy God, and that's beyond us, but I mean, if you could think of a holy God, a holy God is a holy God. I mean, there's no, if he had cells in his body, there wouldn't be one that was wrong, okay? Everything would be holy. Um, he's just holy. And uh, what we went through was uh, the three essential points were total depravity, Unconditional election, irresistible grace. Total depravity means that even your soul, you could not exercise your will to be saved. You couldn't do that on your own, period. You've got no will, understand that? Because that is also part of your depravity. So you can't even decide until you know you're in this unconditional election. All right? There's no condition. He elected you, saved or not saved. If you're sitting here and you're saved, well, what happened to you, see? Was this irresistible grace come move upon you, and you just couldn't stand it? And you said, yeah, and you're saved. But you know you're saved because you were saved before. It's just you just never knew that until the irresistible grace got a hold of you. And the reason why you didn't know that, that because you're totally depraved, you have no will. But since you were the elect, then the irresistible grace come over there and touched you, and then you exercised the will, which apparently he gave you, and you says, I want to be saved. You had to say it. But I don't know why you would say you want to be saved if you're already saved, if you were already predestined, preordained to be saved before you exercised your will. It is messed up. The people are nuts. I tried studying this thing with my mind all the way through. I, I get, it's, it's bad enough as deep as I go with God, thinking, I mean, I think I'm deep sometimes, to uh, try to understand what they're teaching, apart from the Bible. If you really believe what they taught, then you're here. Not because you wanted to be here, but because somehow God moved upon you. And then all of a sudden you says, okay, I want to be here. Did you get that yet? Not that you don't want to be here, but the reason you want to be here is because God moved on you to get you here. In other words, you're here because God predestined and preordained for you to be here. Before the foundation of the world, he decreed it. Now the problem with the teaching this is, half of the stuff is true. You know, it's like a half-truth in everything. And uh, where we teach that you're depraved, but you have a will. In other words, you can't get saved because of any good works that you do. You're not worthy enough. This flesh right here cannot save you, period. Jesus Christ had to die for you, and you got saved, but you heard the word of God, you exercised your will. You had to exercise your will, where they believe you didn't, unless irresistible grace came by. But how many of you heard the gospel and got saved the first time? You know, you how many times you heard the gospel? How many times maybe you got scared a little bit, like maybe they're right? You know, when you said maybe they're right, guess what happens to you? You go on another step with God. When you says maybe they're right, means that you're considering what you heard. And if you consider what you heard and you die in a car wreck, man, I'm telling you what, you got some problems, don't you? Unless you were saved. But most people don't get saved first time. Especially the older you get. So just the very fact that you rejected God means that this is out the window because you resisted the grace of God. Do you understand that? So far, just a little bit here? Okay. And then this gets me mad. I'll, we'll preach on that me one time. I mean, to even think that his atonement is limited. You say, what's atonement? Remember the word again? 
Don't forget this, it's sort of easy. But it's at, right? At one mint. At one mint. Made one with who? With God. How could you get to God? There had to be an atonement for your sins. No sinner can go before God. He's a holy God. So Jesus Christ died for the world, the sins of the world. He made atonement for our sins. What did he do? He made us at one with who? With God. What a blessing. But see, that's only me because I'm elected. So you better make sure you're elected because if you don't know you're elected, man, you've got a problem. You only think you're saved because you're not elected, see? Preacher, don't mess with our heads like that. I know. But that's what they do. They mess with your heads. This whole theology messes with your head. Most of these people that think they're elected and they get, they get so arrogant and they think that they're God's gift to the world, you know, and that's how they go along with life. And then towards the end of their life, you get them on the bed and some of them don't even think they're elected anymore. They're on their deathbed and they're confused. Like, maybe, maybe I'm not elected. Oh, goody. Now you've got problems. Your entire 20, 30, 40 years of your life, you thought you were elected. Now you're ready to croak, man. Now you got some doubts. Maybe it's because you never practiced uh, what we call um, asking God uh, uh, to cleanse you up, to regain a little fellowship with him every time you blew it. Because they don't even have to do that. They don't have to tell God they're sorry. They're already elected. Isn't this a great study? Doesn't it just help you out? You say, preacher, why do we need this? I don't know. You're going to run into somebody somewhere. As a Christian, you're going to bump into somebody that will bring up that word election. And uh, next thing you know, only a few people will be getting saved, and they'll have to be one of them. And because they don't like you, you'll probably be one that's not saved. And all the convincing in the world will not get them saved. Because they, they can't get saved. Because they didn't have that irresistible grace. I know I'm making it seem a little funny because to me it is funny. There's some serious people in this, wrapped up in this theology here. So what I'd like to do is go through a few scriptures tonight just to, just to handle a little bit and then we'll put, uh, we'll put a little thing on the board. I'll try to erase that, just a little thing, and, and just show you some, some things that this fellow wrote in his book that I've been going over in, in, in my mind and trying to help me out uh, with this uh, theology. Remember, theology is a big word. Don't go to sleep on them big words. It just as a big word means... Studying God, you know, that's all, theos, you know. Uh, when somebody says they're enthused, uh, they lie, 99.5% uh, percent of the time. I'm enthusiastic about this sport. See, the whole word means in God. See, when you're enthusiastic and you're excited, you're excited about God. You're enthused. Anyway, they misappropriate the word, that's all. We always say, oh, I'm enthusiastic about hockey. I'm enthusiastic about this. I'm the... Well, you're a fan. You're a fanatic. You're excited about the game. But enthused, the definition is in God, no matter what they say. And I just said that because theology is in there too. The theo is in there. And all that means is God, Greek thing for God. So that's theology. Whenever you say somebody say, well, what's your theology on this? What's your interpretation on this? They're, first off, they're trying to see if you know the word theology. If you don't, then you're some old hick or some bumpkin somewhere, and they're going to really, they're going to really smoke you, man. But now you're going to look at them and say, oh, the study of God? Well, I have a King James Bible that explains it per perfectly clear to me. You know, just talk back to them a little bit. It's interesting. Now go to Ephesians chapter uh, 2, and uh, so that you can see the verses in the Bible, because that's important to see verses in the Bible. There's a Mount Zion in Pensacola, Florida that's a deeper life uh, type publication and they're, uh, they're elected and, and uh, they point out all of Spurgeon's election stuff and everybody else's and I've even got the Westminster uh, Confessional of 1689 in my office uh, which was a, a, a reformed uh, a declaration of what they believed back there in England and before and a lot of the Baptists used that also because it was one of the first uh, uh, constitutions that they used to uh, start churches with. And in that Constitution, it does say stuff about the sovereignty of God, uh, predestined, pre uh, uh, preordained, and, and that they believed in the, the election of uh, people unto salvation and, and those unto damnation. And, and so you see, this has been around a long time. But it's nothing the Lord taught. It's nothing the Bible teaches. It's people getting sometimes into those original languages, and they get so stinking deep that they get lost. 
That's the only thing I can come up with. And it's good for the elect. I mean, if you're the elect, you know you're the elect, and you can, you know, it's almost like a bunch of rich people getting together and they keep the money in themselves. They don't want to share it with nobody else, so they devise a system to where they're all comfortable with. And it's a lot of these religious people, that's what they, they've done. And a lot of them saved, born again. Uh, the theology's messed up, though, and I'll show you that in here. Remember, we're talking about pre predestined, preordination. We're talking about uh, unconditional uh, election, and we're just combining a lot of stuff here. Verse 1 says this, And you hath he quickened who were, what? In trespasses and sins. All right? Now, who's he talking to? And you, and look at that, hath, past tense, he quickened, who were, past tense, dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world. Understand? This person right here is a living, breathing human. And he was walking a certain way in the world. Did you see this? This is what we're talking about. We're not talking about before the foundation of the world. We're talking about somebody walking in the world. According to the prince of the power of the air. And who's that, people? Who's his Satan in it? Prince of the power of the air. What is the air? It's atmosphere. It's what you breathe. It's what you look at. It's everything around you, man. And who's the prince of it? The devil. Never forget that. It's true. That's what it is. All right? Now, just follow with me. According to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all, see that word? Had. Had our conversation in times past. How? In the lust of our flesh. Fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the what? Mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Did you see any? You see anybody divided in here yet, Gary? I mean, is there anybody like like the elect or the unelect? Or is he talking about? Is this? He's talking about this. Is what you were before you were saved. He made no exception for anybody in here. That's everybody. You were. You had. Now look at verse four. But God, who is rich in mercy. For his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we what? Were. See? Were. Dead in sins. Hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. And hath raised us up together. Now watch it. When did he do all this? Look at verse 5 again. Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. As soon as you got saved, guess what happened? Verse 6. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That happened after you were saved. Not before you were saved. Not before you were born. You had to be saved. Um, verse 12. Look at verse 12. We'll get, get into these words again. I like them. It says that at that time ye were without Christ. Being, in other words, there was a time when you were what? Without Christ. Being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Now, that's where you were before you were saved. If you're a Calvinist, listen to this. Guess what, bud? You were lost. You were lost, 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 just like everybody else was, until you got saved. Because verse 13 says, but now, in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off, are made nigh by the what? And listen here, that blood wasn't shed until Calvary. That blood was literally shed at Calvary. Everybody understand that now? It's pretty... When I go with the words and the halves and the past tense, I like that stuff. Now, now that we're saved, people, just, we'll just stop. We'll just stop for a minute and think about this. Now that we're saved, does that mean, does that mean that the prince and the power of the air has no more effect on us? No. Does it mean that the lust of the flesh, all of a sudden, now that we're saved, they just go away? No. Does it mean that the spirit that working down in disobedience can't affect us? No. 
You know why? Because you can still be disobedient. You can still go to lust of your flesh. And that boogeyman can still influence you. Because of what? The old man. You got a new nature now, though, don't you? That's on the inside. That's the one that has a problem with the old man. Everybody understand that? Just so we can go on. I mean, that's where the fight starts. That's where the battle starts. New man against us. Pride. Right? And that's the way it's going to be until you hit the grave. But you, you have to realize that there are spirits. Uh, that devil's not going away until at that time appointed. You're still in the flesh <laughs> when you're walking around here. And you still got problems. But thank God you know when you got saved. And when you got saved, you passed from death on to life. You were quickened, the Bible says. So if it says you were this past tense, and that's what you strive to be what? Against. You strive to be against what you were, because that's the dead man. Now you're trying to live a new life in Christ Jesus. That's the life that's full of abundancy and joy and peace in the Holy Ghost. So when you don't have the peace and the joy in the Holy Ghost, you can trace it back to you're living like the old man. Everybody understand that? Okay, a little theology, a little study of God. So according to these passages right here, the elect, we're talking facetiously now, uh, for, the, for the Calvinist. After I'm saved, though, guess what I'm called? The elect, okay? So just so you got that. According to these passages, the elect were children of wrath. According to Ephesians 2.3. And they were without God, according to Ephesians 2.12. Not children of God. They were without God. But not only do Calvinists claim that the elect were in Christ before the foundation of the world, they also maintain that the elect were in Christ at the cross. So what is the problem? The problem is a... Man, a monumental one. <laughs> I mean... You think about this. What a momentous event that took place between the foundation of the world and the cross. You got the fall of Adam. This means that before the elect got in Adam, according to 1 Corinthians 15, 22, they had a relationship with Christ. This is where it gets deep. This is where I had to change some of my thinking. You know how easy it is for a person, once they're saved, to fall into this? You'll fall into it like that. You know why? Once you got saved, all of a sudden you look back and it's almost like you seem like you were always saved. It seemed like God was always there protecting you. Always watching over you. You should have died here, 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 here. And you didn't. Because I was the elect. God knew I was going to get saved anyway. It's easy to fall into that. Well, what you need to realize, when you got born again you got saved, you did a perpendicular trip, man. You went directly straight. Didn't, didn't, you, didn't made, you passed go. You didn't pay 200 bucks, man. You went right to the throne. You were baptized into Christ. Now you have a heavenly outlook. You have an eternal outlook. You have a spiritual person inside of you. And what will happen is you can get wrapped up in this stuff and not, and not remember that. You had no really consciousness of what was going on until after you got saved. You may have been brought up around the Bible. You may have been brought up around the words. But you had no real consciousness inside and peace about your relationship with God until after you got saved. And then it takes a while to grow into that. But a lot of people look back and they'll start reading certain books. And next thing you know, their brain will be where these people are right here. And next thing you know, they won't witness they will not tell anybody about the Lord, period. Because it, it, it's almost as if, if God wants me to, then bless God. You know, lightning's going to come down, going to hit me on the head, and I'm going to say, Jesus. And that's, then you develop your own little walk with God like that. Problem is, God will make people bump into you and you still won't talk. And, to, and, and you wonder why you have a bad day. And I include myself in this, is because we're disobedient to the Holy Ghost. And I can prove that from Scripture. Because if He's in us, He is the witness, and who He likes to talk about is, his, is Jesus Christ. Do you understand that? That is His thing. He, he just uplifts Jesus Christ all the time. The Holy Spirit does. Loves to talk about Him. 
And that's why whenever you get to talk about him, you know how excited you get and your heart gets pumping? Just pumps that blood up and you get real excited and you, you love talking about Jesus. See, that's your new man. You love talking about him. But it, it just takes sometimes a shock for something to happen to us to get to talking about him. And that's the problem. Now you've got to follow this stuff through because this, sort of, this is sort of real screwy. We'll just make a weird tree again. I'm using grapes, sorry. That doc got me hooked on that now. Until I get off of that and go back on the apple, I've got to stick with grapes. <laughs> Some will split a church over that. Nagelski teaches heresy. Because of grapes. Okay, where are we at? We're back over here after the cross, right? After the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Isn't that us? Okay. Now, what these electors are saying, if I get this right, they're over here. This is where they are. Okay? This is where they are. This is where it all starts off. They're starting right here. Now, even though I know my Bible says that all that are, are in Adam. Remember that verse? All in Adam. Wherefore, by one man sin entered in the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men. Somebody said that the second Adam had to come on the scene to make up for the first Adam's mistake. I mean, that's what I just heard in the Bible. 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 So, now either these weren't all in the first Adam, which makes my Bible a lie, and which they really believe, you know? Or oh, they're absolutely nuts. They're, not, they're just having read their Bible. They're, they're just stupid. They're just stupid. I get mad thinking of them, especially, I just, they just, they drive me crazy. Just wait, I'll, I'll get in this. I got to get read this thing because I, I don't know if I quite understand this yet myself, what they believe. But I'm trying. Now, do some of these guys really preach? Yeah, I got books in there, man. They got some messages, boy, that are, I love Spurgeon. I love a lot of people that, are, that, that believe in the tulip. Some of them emphasize a certain one of those tulips more than the others. The ones that always make it are the ones that still win souls for Jesus Christ because they don't know who the elect are, so they're just going to tell everybody about Jesus and then the elect will find out. Well, they see they're going for the Lord. They got initiative. They love souls. What can you do with them? You got to love them. But these other airheads, you know, grace to you and they... No, they're, they're just wrong. They don't have the Bible. So I have to consider this. Number one. The elect were in Christ before the foundation of the world. Now watch this now. Then the elect fell out of Christ and became lost in who? Adam. Then the elect got back in Christ at the cross. Whew. Man. Then, because you've got to follow this now. Because remember, they're 2,000 years down the line. This, this theology didn't happen with Christ, okay? Well, let's just think of them today, 2002. This guy's got to believe he was there. Then he fell with Adam. Amen? Then somehow he got back into Christ. And then, and then, then, then he fell out of Christ. Let me get this together. I've got to get this together again. It's going to be confusing on the tape. It's confusing to me. Number one, the elect were in Christ before the foundation of the world. The elect fell out of Christ and became lost in Adam. Then the elect got back in Christ at the cross. That was 2,000 years ago, you know. Then the elect fell out of Christ again so they could be born in sin, because that's what the Bible was saying. Then the elect got back in Christ when God applied irresistible grace to them, and they got saved. Whew. That's hairy. Did you hear what I said? I mean, I mean, are you following this? That's what they believe. 
Because they, got, they had to fall somewhere. I mean, how can they even have, why would they need an irresistible grace? To let them know that they're the elect. If you understand this, thank you. I'd rather think that because of Adam's sin, that sin passed to all men. Any flesh person that had need of blood to have life, amen, got Adam's sin. And when he got old enough to know, or she got old enough to know when she was a sinner, that she needed a what? A savior. When that knowledge came to her of her sin, and I believe the Holy Spirit's job is to do that, conviction of sin. But it's not the Holy Spirit's job to keep saying, okay, you're in, no matter what you feel, no matter how you act, because you just can't resist me. No, he convicts of sin and judgment to come. Now, the Holy Ghost does that. The individual has to exercise their right, okay, their will to accept Jesus Christ. That's what I believe. And I believe when you do that then, when you did that, when you accepted Christ, then you went just like this. You entered into Jesus Christ's suffering 2,000 years ago. You entered into him paying the full price for all your sins because it was your sins. You see, you entered into him. But in doing that, you also, also were buried and rose again with him. You see, now you're up here. Spiritually speaking. But you did that because of you exercising your will. So now that you're up here, guess what? You've got spiritual eyeballs. And you can see things you never could see before. That book started opening up to you, and all you need is one of these airheads to come along and say that you were here all the time. Well, if everybody was here all the time that was elected, why would God kill his own son? People are idiots. I got a masochistic father now? What are they saying? I got a saddest for God the Father's a, a holy God's going to do that? They're stinking nuts. They wear suits, ties. They're perfect people, but they're stinking nuts because this is idiotic. But they'll sit around and they'll think about this all their days of their life and they go, hopefully they're saved. You know, some of these birds don't even believe in conviction. They believe they just grew up into it. They were catechized, you know, the people in the Presbyterian church and stuff like that, Reformed church, they went through catechism, did their little thing, and they're in, man, because they're the elect. You say, when did you ask Jesus to save you? Oh, I've always been in. And they're just as confident and cocky as they can be. They never were convicted of their sin. Nothing made them realize they were a sinner. They never asked Jesus Christ to save them, personally. Not all of them, but most of those Presbyterians and people are like that. But if you can see, it's sort of crazy, isn't it? We're talking about the Bible now. Now, when we all get up into glory, hey, man, and the former things are done away with, we ain't going to worry about it anyway. But right now, we have fun in the Lord. We can, we can visualize him at times. We can see these things. We say, wow, this is really neat how God's putting all this together before the foundation of the world to the end. It's like a big loop, you know? It's like this was his will at the beginning. They had a little glitch in the thing, you know? And all of a sudden, it all worked out to come out exactly the way he wanted it to be. That's neat to think like that, because that's God. But my position in Christ is because I exercise my free will. I wanted to be saved. <laughs> and there was many times I rejected it, which, which throws that irresistible grace out. And for me to think about my pedigree and my background and to think I was worthy enough to be elect, that would shoot that uh, atonement thing right out the wall. Limited. Wasn't that what it was? Limited atonement? That's part of the tulip? Limited atonement. I mean, Jesus Christ only died for the elect, period. And those elect were elect before the foundation of the world, and those that were elect, the damnation was, was done the same time before the foundation of the world. If you get to thinking like that, you'll go crazy. And you don't even want to get me going on removing your name from the Lamb's Book of Life. You ever read that? You ever read that in your Bible? Hmm? Somebody's name can be blotted out of the book? Who's the author of life? God. Thank you, class. God. God is the author of life. He's the originator of life. 
Every woman that conceives, guess what? That's life. Isn't it? Isn't that, what we th isn't that abortion when they do something to them, 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 that thing? I think that's what this is about, this whole big old movement going on in our country to try to get the Supreme Court to overrule some things. Well, that conception, what does it mean? Conception. What, what's a conception? What does the word mean? What's concepted? What can you concept? Well, conception is what? L-I-F-E. The Bible says that God is the creator of life. So, if I was born, Brother Barry, it's very possible my name's already in the book. Right? I mean, I'm in the book. Say I'm in the book of life. Just say. It's just, just, just a little hypothetical thing. I don't know if I can prove it or not. So it's just, it's just Pastor Nagelsky's theology. Here I get born, and, uh, you know, Bob's born. He's in the book. All of a sudden, the Holy Spirit comes knocking on my door, you know, and I reject it, and I reject it, and I reject it, right? All of a sudden, I get hit by a car leaving church, and I die. I wonder if somebody comes by and just takes that name out. It's just a thought. It's a thought. That's all. I can't prove it. I know there's a book with names on it. And I know the only person that can blot it out is God. But somebody's got to exercise their will. Yes, sir. Yeah, new name written down in glory. Well, you don't know what the name is. No man knows your name. The Lord knows your new name. Right? Messing with them songs again, Barry. Barry, I love it, Barry, yeah. Okay, let's rip that one out of him. Right? He says he's going to blot some people's name out of the Word of God. What scares me is about messing with the book. And I believe in eternal security. But there is play, three places mentioned in that book about messing with the Scriptures. And I don't know what it's talking about exactly, but... That would scare me if I was a Bible corrector. Did I conf can totally confuse you now? Vera, are you confused now? <laughs> you will not sing that song again. Just sing Onward Christian Shoulder or something. That'll work out good. I mean, it's a great, exciting thing. In other words, you go up to heaven, and you found out you was always there to begin with. All right? If you go with the eternal loop like that, that you finally got saved, you went up to heaven, found out that you were already there anyway, you follow me? Then what's the cross for? What's, that whole, what's the whole purpose of the cross? Why do it? I mean, just get born and croak and go back to heaven. I mean... Okay. Now, if the elect, we're talking about the elect, like they use it. If the elect have from all eternity been justified, children of God, then why must they be regenerated and believe on Christ? Can a, let's see, can an eternally justified elect child of God go to hell? This is confusing. See, you're all falling asleep on me. I'm sorry, man. This is just a stupid doctrine these suckers believe. And if you're a Bible believer, you better know what you believe. Because you get lost in that thing, down, you know, and you're going to stay in your little bedroom all day and not, not eat bonbons and just don't give a rip. Because you're going to heaven anyway, bless God. You don't have to fear God. You don't have to do nothing, man. Just live like hell. Let every your neighbors go to hell. Because the ones that are going to hell are going to hell anyway, bless God. Who gives a rip? Let your mom and daddy go to hell. Let your uncles and sisters and brothers go to hell. This stuff is of the stinking devil, man. I mean, you got neighbors flopping off, croaking. You got this Betsy croaking over here. She's probably going to go to hell. Her whole family's going to hell. And they'll just say, well, that's because they were elected. Well. And how can you say they all went to hell? They could have been the ones elected to go to heaven too. Here we go. You know how much scripture you got in the Pauline epistles that instructs you how to live or do and, and, and do not do certain things in the Paul's epistles. You need to read them. 
There is evidence of the Holy Spirit in you. He gives you victory over what? Sin. It's already forgiven. But the stinking old man is so powerful, you got to have the, what? The Holy Ghost to help you. But I thought about that. I mean, how could you even say a person that was elect could ever be said to be lost? The results of the fall is clear. And what is that? It affected all men equally. All men equally. The Bible says this in a couple of verses. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin... And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned, Romans 5, 12. In 1 Corinthians 15, 22, it says this. For as in Adam, all die. What does that mean? If you're a human being, blessed God, you ain't one of them blood-sucking angels from Jupiter. Let me tell you something. This is what happened to you. You got burved in because of that stinking blood, right? That stinking, no good, sinful blood from Adam. He's the daddy. You don't know your daddy, DNA? You'll go back to Adam. Everybody that was ever born, that was human, is in this category right here. You're all in Adam. So it says, for as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. In Christ? Was that before the foundation of the world? Or was that here? It was here. Because in the book of Revelation, something happens to Jesus Christ. You need to read your Bible and find out when it's all over with. Somebody goes back in the Father. And, father's, and the Father's plan is complete, Jason. What is that? He's got a bunch of Jesuses everywhere. That is deep stuff, but it is the right stuff, because what he wants is a bunch of Jesuses. <laughs> I just come do the will of my Father, right? Thank you, Father, for this. Thank you, Father, for that. Everything's the Father. Father this, the Father that. Father loves it. When you think about the word elect, the Bible, all, all, and the Bible also makes it perfectly clear that no one was ever in Christ until his salvation. Go to Romans 16. When I like, what I liked about this study, the part that I did like about it, reassured me some other verses, and these other verses in Paul's epistle showed me how much other stuff I'm not doing. <laughs> You got chapter 16 of uh, Romans, I believe it is. Let's see. Uh, okay. <laughs> now, what we're talking about is, the Bible makes it perfectly clear that no one was ever in Christ until his salvation. You go to Romans 16 and verse 7. The Bible says, salute. Andronus, what is that? Andronicus, is that what it is? Andronicus? Salute Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen, and my fellow prisoners, who are of note among the apostles, who also were where? In Christ before me, before the apostle Paul. They were in Christ. Now, in Calvinism, the elect are all put in Christ at the same time. In the Bible, no one is put in Christ until he is saved. When you go through here, you're going to find that out. You weren't elected... Until you voted, amen? That's the only way it is. That's why I read that verse was, you know, you had Paul, but there was somebody elected in Christ before him. All right? And when you read your Bibles, you're going to find out they got in Christ somewhere. Oh, I got in Christ here. Well, when did you receive Christ? That's the way we usually say it. You know, now I guess you've got to say, when did you repent? And then believe, and then receive Christ. The Bible, they just said, when did you receive Christ? I mean... You know, and then if somebody argues with you, then they got a problem, don't they? Because why would anybody hate telling you when they got saved? 
Why would anybody be upset about anybody asking them if they're saved? Why would anybody say, how dare you? Couldn't you tell? No, I couldn't. How can you tell? Because they look good? They look bad? They look in, the, in between? No, you usually ask somebody, when did you receive the Lord? And then they tell you. No problem. But I've ran across a lot of people where they were just indignant, including preachers. What's your testimony? What's it to you? Wow. Sorry, I'm just wondering. These Calvinists, my goodness. That'd be real short, wouldn't it? When did you receive Christ? Before the foundation of the world. Whoa! Hey, how about talking to him right now and give me like a million bucks, would you please? I mean, I mean, I know you're, you got something going here, man. You're better than Jesus. Because if you got it before the foundation of the world, then you were even before he was slain. You were better than Jesus, I guess. Okay. So when you look at the word elect, it's, uh, it's an amazing thing because the word elect is also applied to Christ Jesus. Go to Isaiah chapter 42. If you're thinking like a Calvinist, you got some bad problems here in your definition of elect. Because, see, when the word elect applies to Christ, its primary emphasis is not on selection, but on the valuation and worth of the subject described. In other words, it emphasizes his worth and his selection. Are you in Isaiah 42? And uh, we'll go to verse 1. And I'll show you who it's speaking of when we make it over to Matthew. You know that Isaiah is a prophet. It's a prophetical book. It says this. Behold, my servant, whom I uphold, mine, what? Elect, in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the, what? That's speaking of Jesus Christ. And the prophet calls him, says that God says, mine elect. What does that mean? That's his selection. You know what I mean? That's just God's selection. This is my elect, man. I like Brother Maddox to lead music. How's that? Go to Matthew chapter 12. I'm just, I'm just showing you now. I could go into Peter, too, because they use the word elect with Peter, and it's the same, same principle. It's his worth. It's his selection. Doesn't mean before the foundations of the world all the time, you know. You know, some of you may, you, you may go to your grave at 105 years old and never come across one of these people, but at least if the thought occurs to you and gets you thinking funny, at least you can just say, bless God, I'm just an old-time sinner saved by grace. And that'll keep you humble. Because when you get to verse 18, chapter 12. Behold my servant, whom I have what? Are we missing a word there? Are we missing a word there? Does, isn't the rule Scripture with Scripture? Well, isn't that amazing that chosen and elect are interchangeable here in my Bible, Old and New Testament? You know, chosen somebody. You know. He said, Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him and he shall show, shew judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not strive nor cry, neither shall any man hear his voice in the streets. And you go through all this, man, it's all Old Testament. A bruised reed shall he not break, and smoking flax shall he not quench. Are we different than him or what? You ever read down there? Till he send forth judgment unto victory. And in his name shall the Gentiles trust. Do you see that in verse 20? And in verse 21? In his name shall the Gentiles trust.
And who's it talking about? Jesus, because in 22 it says, Then was brought unto him, one possessed with the devil, blind and dumb, and he healed him, insomuch that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. Well, I'm glad that guy probably says, I'm glad I'm elected and predestinated for this, this guy to, you know, heal me. And all the people were amazed and said, Is not this the son of David? Wouldn't that, isn't that amazing for those people even living back there to say, is that it's not him, the son of David? David's been dead how long? I don't want to get into that either. But the apostle Peter, it's also talked about him. It's also talked about elect. Something that's put worth on. Has anybody got this yet? Are the verses plain? Did uh, I say the right verses? Did I quote the right verses? I mean, did you read the same thing I read? Can you understand that you can reject the Holy Ghost of God? Can you understand that? You can. And you do. Don't you? Every time, every time you do wrong, what do you think you're doing when you feel bad? You're rejecting the Holy Spirit of God, aren't you? And that's after you're saved. Understand, Barry? I mean, yeah, we're not total, yeah. We're not totally sanctified yet. There's three, three, three steps in our total sanctification, amen. But one day we'll get our new body. Apparently with our new name, Barry. Yeah. And we won't have to worry about those former things because they'll be done away with. And all the things that we're thinking about now when we get up there, we think we're going to get answers, we're going to figure it out, it's garbage. You get up there, it's a new ball game. You know, but it's nice to think about things down here to encourage yourself with. But when you get up there, let's, let's face it. I mean, we're going to have a different brain to think with. Have a different body. Our eyeballs are going to see things we never saw before. Our ears will hear, hear things that we never heard before. You know, and that's, that's what encourages us. But as far as our people dying and going to hell and stuff like that, don't you dare sit on your haunches and think that you don't have an obligation to at least give them the gospel. Because you're going to have a rude awakening when you see the Lord Jesus Christ. You do have an obligation. You know. If you don't use go ye in all the world, you better, you better get the mother verses that Paul talks about being an ambassador in Christ, how he beseeches you, how he became all things to all men that some might be saved. He's our example. If he's our example, man, I'm telling you what, that guy didn't shut up. But when you get that mindset where you think everything's just going to, you know, something's going to smack you on the head, or you're going to have a problem. It ain't going to work. Just like you thinking you've got to go to work to get a, get a paycheck and you just sit in bed and just think about it. And then Friday, go down and try to get one. Be about the same thing, you know. He could have ordained angels to do it. Instead, he let us do it. And the more you witness, the more you do what? You stay clean. Why? Because you know it's a bummer, man. You go run in your mouth a whole lot, just like bumper stickers when you go through the red light. Oh, man. I wear some shirts sometimes, and I'll say something or do something, and I'll say, oh, no. Boy, Jesus would have been pleased with that, and you've got to cover everything up and get out of there before somebody sees something. You know. But if you don't say nothing, you can just about do anything, I guess. Nobody will even, what is that? There's not enough evidence to convict you of being a Christian. So you can just live like hell, I guess. But you ought to feel bad, I think. But this is this. Do you want to go further with the study next week? We can. We can get into whatever the other ones are. But I'm, I'm about burnt out on this study. Do you understand what they're getting at? They want you to think that they were before the foundation of the world. They didn't need Jesus Christ really to, to die, buried or resurrect, because if they were elect, they're elect. They don't need to be saying that they were elected, then they, they died in Adam, and then you know, they come back up with the second Adam and stuff like this. I ain't buying none of that. It's not Bible. They're, they're messed up. My Bible says we're all, we were all dead in Adam, first Adam. You got saved, you were made alive in the second Adam. That's how that works, right? I mean, it makes sense, don't it? You had to get saved. And how'd you get saved? You asked Jesus to save you. Pretty good to me. You're here today, you're saved, right? No, if you ask Jesus to save you, you're saved here today. Okay, let's... let's Let's break it. That's it, man. Let's break up for prayer.